of David Dunford to you today. He has spent his career in the U.S. Foreign Service, half of it spent in the Middle East, including stints as amb acting ambassador to Saudi Arabia and ambassador to Oman. I have heard the ambassador speak several times, and ha it has always been very instructive. I've always learned a lot. So it is my pleasure to turn the mic over to the ambassador. So much. Sorry you don't all have seats. Uh, first of all, I learned something. Uh, next time I accept a speaking gig or try to think about it, accepting a speaking gig, I'm going to look at the basketball schedule. <laughs> Arizona and Oregon play at 3.30, and here I am. But <laughs> um, I need to tell you a little story. Um, I love Green Valley. Uh, the U of A uh, sent me down to talk about the Middle East, I think, about the Middle East, in Green Valley, I think it was 2016, and the auditorium up on the hill there was filled with about 250 people, and people were standing, as you are today, people were standing along the walls, and people sitting behind me on the podium, and I said, wow, I mean, Green Valley, woo, <laughs> and I went back to my class, and I had, you know, I, usually had 50 students in the Arab-Israeli conflict class. That year it was down to 29 and only seven of them showed up. <laughs> and I, that's when I uh, retired from being an adjunct instructor through I just started coming down here a couple times a year to talk to the <laughs> Green Valley. Because uh, I like people in the seats. Uh, so anyway, thank you. And Green Valley Democrats, I thought there'd be five of you. Um, <laughs> so I'm really impressed because uh, I would like you guys to uh, be supporting the winners. Um, all right, let's let's look at uh, Israel Hamas. But anyway, um, December, uh, October seventh. Um, anyway. October 7th was a horrific day in Israel's history. Over 1,200 people killed, over 3,000 wounded. Um, as of today, at least according to uh, Hamas statistics, over 26,000 Palestinians have been killed, and many more injured, and many of them are women and children. The um, Hamas and like-minded groups in Gaza are holding at least 129 Israelis hostage, although in some cases they may already be dead. There is also violence in the West Bank. Settlers, uh, you know, are uh, Israeli settlers, which of which there are well over 250,000, I think. Uh, and uh, Palestinians, the tension between them has, has certainly risen since October 7th. And uh, there's tension on the border in Lebanon. In fact, a lot of Israelis living along the border in Lebanon are now in hotels in places like Tel Aviv. So it's a, it's a situation that the Israeli government uh, really doesn't want to go on for an extended time. So there's a lot of danger of an expanded war. The Houthis, who most Americans never heard of, are you know firing at ships in the Red Sea and really causing uh, a great deal of, of harm. Uh, you have to think through what it means to have less ships going through the Red Sea or ships being diverted. Um, Egypt depends very heavily on Suez Canal revenues and the revenues are way down. Uh, that's just one, one issue. Um, and finally, the backdrop of all this is that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is now running the most right-wing government really since Israel's founding. And also, he is um, facing three different trials for corruption. And uh, it's hard uh, to imagine that he wants this war to come to a quick end because the chances are he will no longer be prime minister. Um, Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, when he came into office, created a, a great domestic political crisis by something he called judicial reform form in quotes, which would essentially weaken the Israeli Supreme Court. Now Israel doesn't have a written constitution, so the Supreme Court has quite a bit of latitude in, in uh, their decisions. Uh, and it's been a thorn in the side of uh, people who want to expand settlements in the West Bank, and also on Benjamin Netanyahu himself, who 
uh, again, the Israeli justice system is pretty, uh, pretty hard on political leaders, but a few of them have gone to jail in the past. All right, I'm going back to basics here. Uh, I have kind of fly-in thing here. Yeah. Uh, only a couple of slides, uh, but show me the first one. Uh, I'm just going to tell you a lot about how uh, Israelis and Palestinians uh, are amazingly similar. They're all Semitic. Uh, you know, according to the Bible, descended from uh, Noah's oldest son. Anyway, there's solidarity, both uh, Arabs and Jews based on religion, culture, and language. Religion is central to the history of each. Uh, each had a coherent, yeah, put them all up. Each had a coherent political community long before modern nationalism came to Europe. Uh, each saw their communities as an expression of God's will, and each played only a peripheral role in each other's history. If you uh, know anything about Muslim Spain, you know, back before Ferdinand and Isabella and Columbus, um, both the Jews and the Muslims got along quite well, and the uh, Catholics came along and threw them both out of the country. Uh, that's an important part of the, the history of both uh, the Israelis and Palestinians. Slide, please. All right, the British are the ones that screwed everything up. <laughs> um, we'll begin with the Hussein McMahon correspondence. Uh, McMahon was a British high commissioner in Cairo, and he wrote to the Sharif of Mexa, Mecca, Mecca, not Sheriff, but Sharif, an honorary title. And Hussein wrote back, and McMahon agreed that uh, the British would support the independence of the Arabs after the war. This, you remember the war, First World War, they wanted, the British wanted the Arabs to rise up against the Ottoman Empire. If you saw Lawrence of Arabia, you know all about this. Uh, they don't make four-hour movies anymore, I don't think, which is good. sykes Pico. Sykes was a British Foreign Office guy. Pico was a French Foreign Ministry guy. They got together and agreed how to split up the region after the war. So um, the French got Lebanon and Syria, the British got Palestine, uh, Iraq, Jordan, and we were able to hang on to Egypt. Then along came the Balfour Declaration. Slide, please. Lord Balfour was a British Foreign Secretary, and this is what his declaration said. And I'll just draw your attention to a couple of things. One is, he didn't promise them a state. He promised them a national home. And the other is, the declaration says that uh, the rights of non-Jewish communities, in other words, Arabs in this case, would not be uh, trampled upon or the rights of Jewish people who lived outside of Palestine. Fast forward to the World War II, the end of World War II, the United Nations, the British fed up with uh, Arabs and Jews fighting with each other, and there were many more Jews by World War II. Why? Because uh, Hitler came to power in Germany. That's one reason. Two, the United States had a very tough anti-immigrant uh, policy. There was a lot of anti-Semitism in this country and uh, <coughs> Jews were not allowed into the United States in, in large numbers. If you've been to the Anne Frank Museum in Amsterdam, there's a, a letter displayed from the consular officer to the Franks uh, denying their visas to come to the United States. Um, the UN proposed a partition plan. The map is on the left of the partition plan. It would give about 42% of historic Palestine to the Arabs and maybe 56% uh, to the, uh, the Jews and uh, Jerusalem would be an international city and uh, Arabs opposed it uh, it was okay with the Jewish community the Arabs invaded and the right map is what happened after the invasion the Israelis prevailed and uh, controlled 78% of historic Palestine, leaving the West Bank. The West Bank was actually controlled by Jordan until 1967, and Gaza was controlled by Egypt until 1967. Can you explain the colors we couldn't... You know, colors? On that map, the purple and the blue... And oh, okay. Um, the, uh, 
was it beige? Let's call it blue and beige. Is that okay? I'm not great great with colors. Uh, but the um, the beige is Arab, Arab territory, or Palestinian, and the blue is um, what the UN proposed that the Jews have, and the purple is what they took over in the War of Independence, 1947-48. Uh, the Israelis were complicated people, as we are, um, and there are several kind of fault lines. Uh, the two words at the top are plural, Ashkenazis and Sephardis. Ashkenazis are generally Jews who immigrated from Europe, and Sephardis are generally descendants of the Jews that were thrown out of Spain in the, in the 15th century. Uh, you also hear the term Misrahi, which generally means uh, Arabs, not only the Sephardis, but any Arabs communities that exist, I'm sorry, Arab Jewish communities that existed throughout the Middle East. Uh, quite a few Russians came after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, the figure is very approximate. Uh, uh, there, there are a lot of uh, Russian Jews who came, and about 20,000 Ethiopian Jews who are Falasha, which uh, remember in the 1980s when I was working in Cairo, the Israelis managed to fly them over Sudan and into, into Israel. Uh, Jews from Yemen are a fairly large minority. Religious secular. Uh, there are quite a few ultra-Orthodox, there's one term, or Hadadim. Uh, these are people who look like they got stuck in Eastern Europe in the 19th century, the way they dress. Their population is growing much faster than the secular Israelis. Uh, so their political power has grown also. Revisionism and labor Zionism, an important distinction. A revisionist is someone with the dream of greater Israel. In other words, expanding the boundaries of Israel to all of historic Palestine, to the Jordanian border. And for a revisionist, Jordan should be the Palestinian state. Labor Zionists and the Labor Party ran Israel until 1977 and briefly thereafter um, in, in spurts, but um, the Labor Party in the recent, most recent elections, which were late 2022, uh, had only four seats out of 120 in the Israeli parliament, the Knesset. Uh, Gush Emunim, community of believers, generally represented the settlers. By settlers, there's Israelis who moved into the West Bank after 1967. And uh, there are many uh, Jews from all over the world who immigrated to Israel. Can't hear you back here. Jews from all over the world who immigrated to Israel. Uh, he was an uh, American Israeli uh, who lived part of the time in New York City, died in New York City. He raised a lot of money for a political program of racism and intimidation. His political party, Koch, was banned in Israel for racism. He was shot. Um, by a uh, Arab American, perhaps, in 1990. But he has quite a few disciples. Baruch Goldstein was a uh, lived outside of Hebron in the West Bank in 1994, I believe it was. And he went down to the mosque on during Friday prayers and shot. I think it was 37 Palestinians. Um, his grave is in a nearby town, a settler town, and is actually a place of pilgrim for some Israelis. Yigal Amir, he assassinated Yitzhak Rabin, I believe it was November 1995. Uh, he was also a, a follower of uh, Kahane. Today, in the Israeli government, there are two other guys, Smotrich and Ben Gavir, who are also followers of this uh, particular line of thought. Why are they in the government? because Benjamin Netanyahu needed to be, remain prime minister or stay out of jail. All right, Palestinians are complicated people too. They're Muslims, 
there are Christians, quite a few Christians. Uh, certainly Muslims outnumber Christians. Uh, there are secular and Islamic. Uh, there are insiders versus outsiders. By insiders, we mean Palestinians who lived in Gaza or the West Bank. Outsiders are Palestinians who lived in refugee camps in Lebanon, Syria, Jordan. Uh, actually, followers of Ara Arafat who went to Tunisia back in the 1982-83. Old guard, young guard. Uh, old guard, Mahmoud Abbas represents the old guard. He's 88 years old. Uh, it might be time for him to move on. We'll talk about that in a, later. Uh, Gaza versus West Bank, very different uh, politically. And finally, Hamas. Uh, Hamas appeared in the 1980s and gained a lot of strength during what's called the Intifada, which is uh, the um, means shaking off. It was an uprising of Palestinians against uh, Israeli control. And Hamas means uh, Harikat al Mukawama al Islamia. It's an acronym, but it also means uh, zeal and courage, and bravery something in Arabic. Yitzhak Rabin was a, a tough, certainly a labor politician, but also a general, known for really being tough with the uh, Palestinians who rose up in the 80s. Uh, became prime minister about 1992, and he uh, signed the Oslo Accords in 1993. Bill Clinton and Yasser Arafat. Yasser Arafat, I think, is next. Yeah. Uh, anyway, he uh, shook hands with Arafat, which for Rabin was quite a, uh, uh, a stretch. There's, if you look at the picture of the handshake, uh, Rabin looks like he's uh, swallowed a lemon or his dog died or something. <laughs> um, but he did it. Uh, Arafat was um, an amazing character. Tom Friedman described him as leading the Palestinians out of the deserts of obscurity into the land of prime time. But he was, first of all, gave the Palestinians independence because the Palestinians pretty much had to march to the drummer of Nasser, I think, the Egyptian uh, leader. And unity, he brought together the PLO as an umbrella organization, which brought together a lot of disparate Palestinian <coughs> groups. And relevance, I mean, he you know, went to the United Nations and he visited all countries around the world and he generally rolled out the red carpet. And theatrics, uh, just the way he dressed was theatrical. He dressed uh, in the traditional kafia, always had a three-day beard. I don't know how to do that, <laughs> but he was good at it. All right, why do we care about Israel? This is a very complicated question. Strategic, I think the argument there is weak. Um, Israel, when I was in Saudi Arabia for Desert Shield, Desert Storm, we begged the Israelis not to attack Iraq because Iraq was attacking them. Iraq was sending Scud missiles, not only to Riyadh, where I was, and Dahran, but also to Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. And the Israelis wanted to hit back. Jewish American support uh, seems obvious, um, but there's also Christian evangelical support. And um, here the deal is, uh, for a, a number of evangelicals, I believe, I can't remember the, the technical term for it, but believe uh, in the, the end of the days kind of scenario, where the good among us are raptured up into heaven, the bad among us are, are left cope with seven years of uh, tribulations. Uh, there's an evil world leader. And then Jesus returns and provides a thousand years of peace. Um, the Israelis kind of embrace this Christian support, even though in the, in the final analysis, Jews have to be killed or, or, or converted. But there's also broad American support. And there's one is uh, Israel is the region's only democracy. Um, you can argue about that, but inside of Jewish Israel, and, and including Arab Israeli citizens of Israel, the democracy is pretty lively and, uh, and robust. But of course, they are also running the lives of several million Palestinians who don't vote. 
and then of course uh, we have uh, not only sympathy but guilt about the Holocaust because we Americans did not allow Jews to come in large numbers to the United States at that time. Domestic politics. I imagine where this group is uh, spending some time. The uh, APAC, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, is an incredibly effective lobby, kind of like the NRA. And I, I've used the term rhetorical fly zone. Any congressman or senator who was on record as criticizing Israel usually found themselves uh, at the uh, losing end of the next election. Paul Finley was one of those congressmen. He wrote a book called They Dare to Speak Out. Um, and there's a very interesting chapter about the, uh, the day the Jewish community went after the Center for Middle East Studies at the, universe, at the campus of Arizona. Uh, there's something called Campus Watch. I taught the Arab-Israeli con conflict for uh, 20 years, and Campus Watch uh, kind of monitored how people talking about uh, Arab-Israeli issues monitored how they were doing in terms of Israel's interests. Uh, somehow I stayed below the radar on that. Uh, I don't know whether to be proud of that or guilty, but uh, a man named Martin Kramer uh, wrote a whole book about how the government spends too much money on Center for Middle East Studies programs and things like that. Um, the Arab Americans have a lobby, I think uh, I talked to one of you who was involved with that, um, called the Arab American Anti-Discrimination Committee, which uh, is uh, effective but nowhere near in the same league in effectiveness as uh, APAC. The Christians, Christians United for Israel, um, very active program, very much because of their um, ideology, very much support Israel's control of the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, as Israelis would have it. And a new lobby has emerged. Uh, these are set, the pro-Israel group, which is um, for a two-state solution. And uh, I think it's gaining and gaining in credibility, particularly after October 7th. There were a remarkable five years, and uh, it was a time when I was very much in the region. Desert Shield, Desert Storm led to uh, a meeting of Arabs and Israelis and Europeans, and Canadians and Japanese in Madrid. This was, I believe, uh, early November 1991. They agreed on bilateral negotiations with the Israelis and their neighbors, multilateral negotiations, which involved the Europeans and the Japanese and the Canadians. Um, they had five working groups. One of them was on water resources. And I was involved in, in getting the Omanis to agree to host one of these meetings on water resources. The first time uh, any Arab country in the Arabian Peninsula and maybe beyond uh, was actually host for the talks involving Israelis. It was a very exciting time. And the meeting ended up creating a Middle East desalination research center, which still exists today and still involves Omanis and Israelis. Israel also was involved in talks with the Syrians, although they, didn't, they weren't productive, at least during those five years. Uh, so this was the time when uh, better leadership, uh, including on our part, could have produced the kind of two-state solution that would have prevented October 7th. Let's talk about uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. I told you what a revisionist is. Benjamin Netanyahu grew up in a, in a family that believed very much that Israel should, in greater Israel, it should expand to the borders of Jordan. He was in the United States as a teenager. He went back to MIT for an MBA. Um, he was in the Army for five years. Uh, his brother was a military hero. Uh, he was not, although he, he didn't mess up in the military. His brother rescued a hijacked airplane full of Israelis that was forced to land in Uganda and managed to get them out. 
Netanyahu speaks flawless American English, and he's also very good at rhetoric. There are two explanations. Uh, they're not necessarily competing. He's, he's a very political animal. He doesn't want to be outflanked by others in his party. The Likud party is essentially a, a revisionist party. When the, he inherited the Oslo Agreement, when he came to power in, I believe it was 1996, he didn't love it, but in order to maintain American support, he continued to play along, but dragged his feet as, as much as he could. And uh, we kind of let him get away with it, for which I'm, I'm still, I still think was a huge mistake. He represented the Likud Party, and the Likud Party was not about to give up the, gr the dream of greater Israel. Negotiations pretty much collapsed at uh, Camp David 2000. Clinton was on his way out. Uh, Ehud Barak, the labor, last labor prime minister, I guess, was on his way out. Yasser Arafat wasn't ready, but they were all convened at Camp David, and uh, after a couple of weeks, the negotiations collapsed, and that led to a second intifada called the El Aqsa Intifada. And more or less, uh, Ariel Sharon is pictured there. Ariel Sharon was a, a noted, tough uh, minister of defense who led Israel into Lebanon in 1982. Uh, he went up on the Temple Mount, which is a very sensitive place. It's a Muslim place of worship, even though, you know, historically it was where the Jewish Jews built their temple. Uh, that moment, the collapse of Camp David, pretty much uh, sent Palestinians to the left and Israelis to the right. Uh, the Labor Party never recovered. And Israeli Arabs, and there are over a million of them, maybe closer to two million now, uh, were also uh, very much alienated from the Jewish Israelis. Just to focus on on some uh, numbers here, I won't go through them all, but what you should take away from this is there are about as many Arabs as there are Jews in historic Palestine. And in Israel, you know, maintains control over all of them. And that's an untenable situation, I think, as October 7th proved. Donald Trump in my view, didn't help matters. We <laughs> pretended, at least, to be an honest broker between Israelis and Palestinians. And what he did was pretty much cut off our relationship with the Palestinians. The PLO had an office in Washington that was closed. Uh, we had an embassy in East Jerusalem, uh, not an embassy, a consulate in East Jerusalem, where, where our foreign service officers generally stayed in contact with key Palestinians. Um, that became, you know, our... We moved the embassy under Trump to Jerusalem. That was supposed to be something that happened at the end of peace negotiations, not at the beginning. Uh, we recognized Israel's annexation of the Golan Heights. That was during 1967, um, which pretty much meant the end of any hope of reconciliation with Syria. And our peace plan at the time basically uh, supported Israeli annexation of a lot of the West Bank. So it pretty much uh, was one of the reasons why uh, I think that triggered Hamas's uh, action. Uh, I can't tell you Hamas wouldn't have done it anyway, but it certainly didn't help. Next. Um, Trump was quite proud of the Abraham Accords. It's a cute name uh, since both uh, Islam and Judaism and Christianity all come, according to the Bible, from Abraham. Uh, involved, not the Saudis directly, although they were behind the scenes. Involved the United Arab Emirates. Uh, that cost us uh, some F-35s. Involved Bahrain. I'm not sure what we gave them, but probably something. Uh, Morocco joined later. Sudan. Sudan got off the terrorism list. I think they got a loan. But Sudan is now uh, descended into civil war. So that's, they're not very useful members of this group. Uh, 
um, and Bahrain after October 7th of last year, Bahrain pulled back. We're almost done. Um, Israel's new government, just to give you a, a sense of who they are, um, it involves parties that more or less followed Meyer Kahani's ideology and also involved all the religious parties. You have uh, Sephardi religi religious party, Shas, you have uh, Ashkenazi religious parties, and um, they, um, they all support uh, you know, hanging on to the, the West Bank. Um, Israelis protested the judicial reforms. In fact, they were out, I think, every week for months uh, protesting uh, Netanyahu's plan for uh, essentially to water down the Supreme Court. Um, and quite a few Israelis, including in the military, were very disenchanted with uh, Netanyahu, which may have contributed uh, to the fact that they were asleep at the switch on October 7th. All right, last slide. Um, where do we go from here? Uh, it's a brutal situation in Gaza. Um, the CIA director, who's actually a, a friend I've known since the 1980s, Bill Burns is over there now trying to to work, I think, on three different issues. Um, it's going to take, I mean, the, the issues are basically uh, getting a ceasefire and humanitarian aid into Gaza. Um, it's also reforming the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank, uh, essentially replacing Mahmoud Abbas with somebody younger and, and more credible. And uh, finally, um, getting Saudi support and Israeli support for a two-state solution, which uh, the Saudis insist has to be irreversible. Uh, Oslo was not irreversible, as we know. So um, let, let me go back to the previous one. Um, there's a lot of things that need to happen. One is the U.S. has to use its leverage. Using our leverage when you have a the House of Representatives, a wholly owned subsidiary of Donald Trump, is not easy. You need Hamas out of Gaza. Uh, well, the Israelis have had 113 days now, and they, they're nowhere near getting Hamas out of Gaza. So how that happens, I'm not sure. You need the PLO to get to be reformed, more credible, credible enough to be seen as being able to rule Gaza. You need Netanyahu out of the Israeli government. Uh, most Israelis agree. And it, when the fighting is over, it will happen. And then finally, uh, Netanyahu was totally opposed to the two-state solution. He says Israel has to control the West Bank, you know, up uh, all the way to the Jordan border, and you know, also control what goes on in Gaza, at least the security aspects of it. Um, so. The irreversible path to peace won't happen without uh, Netanyahu going. All right, questions? Sorry it took so long. Yeah, Leahy, uh, Senator Leahy, uh, got some legislation through, I think it was in the late 90s, um, uh, which said uh, military assistance to any country which is violating human rights, you know, needs to be stopped. That's, I, that's not a very articulate explanation, but... All right, so Leahy managed to get legislation passed, which is called the Leahy Law, uh, that you can't give the U.S. can't give military assistance to a country which is uh, credibly accused of human rights violations. And your question is, why has it never been applied to Israel? And I would just take you back to uh, my slide on domestic politics. Um, the um, no congressman or senator, you know, you know, really wants to step up to the point of forcing the U.S. government to apply the Leahy law. And the U.S. government, you know, whoever's in charge, and now it's Joe Biden. Um, uh, probably decided in their, their uh, 
deliberations that taking on Congress on uh, cutting off aid to Israel was more than they, would, they could chew. So um, it's never been applied. Lots of people have protested, including inside the State Department. But uh, certainly there are instances, I think, where a strong case could be made that it should, be, should have been applicable to Israel. But the politics are just hard. I should say, Joe Biden, uh, he's a uh, politician. And he, I think, long ago concluded that the way to remain a politician in our country is to make sure there's no light between his position and Israel's position. And uh, uh, this Israel right or wrong and, you know, APAC's more or less adoption of that position, I think, are one basic reason we're all in this dilemma now. I mean, doing what we have to do uh, to solve the israel Hamas issue is so much harder now than it would have been back in the 1990s. So much harder. Mm -hmm. How many Jews were there in Palestine, in Palestine prior to World War II, or the, prior to the end of World War II? Uh, prior to the end of World War II, um, I think, I, I'm reluctant, but it was, um, you know, there were maybe Going up to World War One, there are maybe 80,000. I would think there are at least 10 times that many um, in Israel in World War Two. 800,000 or so? Yeah, but maybe double that. I'm sorry, the, the numbers aren't sticking in my brain. Versus how many Palestinian, actual Arabs then, or Palestinians? How many, how many, how many Muslims living in Palestine. historic Palestine? Yeah. Um, I will tell you that some of them have come in from outside, but there there's, there's never been a, a huge draw uh, on drawing Arabs from other countries into Palestine. What you have is the reverse. You have lots of Palestinians who lived in Palestine or their, or their parents or their grandparents lived in Palestine are in refugee camps in Lebanon and Syria. Jordan allowed them to become citizens and in fact more than half of Jordan's population uh, is of Palestinian ancestry. Um, so there, most Palestinians, including Arab Israelis, uh, you know, their ancestry is original Arabs who live in Palestine. Um, to be honest, Palestine was, under the Ottoman Empire, was not a very uh, heavily populated place. There were maybe half a million Arabs and maybe at most 80,000 Jews. So, but birth rates are high. <laughs>
Shia, uh, there are not many Shia Palestinians, but at the same time, the tensions on the border of Lebanon is with a Shia group, Hezbollah, which, uh, in my view, Israel essentially created uh, when it invaded Lebanon to throw out Arafat back in 1982. So is Saudi Arabia, are they majority Shia? Oh no, oh no, they're Sunni. Sunnis yeah. too, okay. They do have a Shia population in the oh, eastern it. province, yeah, but Thank it's you. a small percentage. Way back. To what extent, in your view, um, is our occupation and concern and involvement in the Middle East plus the Ukraine plus the stability of NATO, is that global dynamic enhancing the danger in the Taiwan Strait. Yeah. All right. Let me let me let me say a couple of things. First of all, yeah, uh, Ukraine is a big issue. Uh, China, Taiwan is a big issue. Other issues with China, and we got North Korea and Iran, Houthis and. Uh, the basic question that we all need to grapple with is, do we have the bandwidth to deal with all this at once? And the answer is uh, pretty uncertain. I mean, one of my things that I preach about uh, at uh, length is the decline of our diplomacy over the last 30 years. And, you know, it's uh, Congress has made it very difficult to appoint ambassadors anywhere. I mean, some of them are in limbo for months. I was in limbo from May until November, I think, before going to Oman. Um, and others, like uh, our ambassador to Italy and our ambassador to Brazil, were you know, well over a year, even though these are important countries. Um, and also, you know, tr Trump pretty much uh, under, you know, with, I don't know, what was the, uh, the oil executive's name, Tillerson. Tillerson, Tillerson and Pompeo pretty much uh, crushed the spirit of a lot of people in the Foreign Service. And we're on, very slowly beginning to build back up, I think. Uh, I think the leadership at the top, Blinken and Burns and Sullivan, is good. But, you know, we need a lot of people on the bench. We need a lot of depth, and we don't have it. And dealing with all these issues at once is a huge challenge. And dealing with it with a divided government. You know, you're, I'm sure you're all focused on the bill that would provide aid to Ukraine, aid to Israel, and more border security. Well, uh, Trump has pretty much uh, ordered the, the House to oppose it because it would help Joe Biden win the election. Patriotism, yes. If not Netanyahu, Yahoo, then who? Who are the leaders that, uh, in Israel that are standing ready to take over if that happens? That's an excellent question. Um, the guy most likely uh, who's already been uh, prime minister before the last Netanyahu government, Yair Lapid, um, he is a uh, you know, former TV anchor, but a, you know, a fairly moderate, middle-of-the-road, centrist kind of guy. There's also a guy named Benny Gantz, who's a you know, retired military, uh, who was brought into this emergency government after October 7th. And uh, he, is a, he would be a credible leader. I think if Israeli elections were held today, Gantz would be, end up being prime minister. So there are leaders out there. Uh, but the Israeli political scene is very complicated. <laughs> All right, I think it's getting dark. <laughs> Sun is over the yard arm. All right. My latest uh, writing effort is a chapter in this book, so just in case anybody's interested. It's not out yet, but it's, uh, at, you know, it, well, it's on Amazon as advanced purchase. Special thanks for David. <laughs>